here with my friend and fellow astrologer, Christina Rodenbeck from the Oxford Astrologer. And we're here to talk about astrology as we do every month. Um, and both Christina and I actually write horoscopes and we have subscription. Um, I have a newsletter, Weekly Horoscopes, and Christina has a membership site for monthly horoscopes. So do please check those out. Hi, Christina, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. I'm enjoying the very hot weather. Yes. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, we're not at the solstice yet, but I always look forward to this time of year. I love June and I love the, sol the summer solstice. Mm. It's a real high point for me, actually. Mm. And we have just, I mean, here in the UK, I mean, we've not had a lot of kind of constant sunshine. It's been quite cool, the temperatures, but this last week, I mean, it's just, we, we're in the heart of summer now, so hopefully it'll last. It's gorgeous. I love it. Mm, mm. It's very, very juicy summer as well mm. uh, so far. Uh, my, my garden is incredible this year. You know, yeah. it's absolutely bursting. Mm. Um, yeah. So what are we talking <laughs> about? What are we doing here? <laughs> well, we, we're going to talk about the last month a little bit, and then we'll talk about the star sign at the moment, and then we'll look at the month ahead. Sally, you've been on TV. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but Sally, you've been on TV. I have, which is absolute classic for Gemini season. Um, the media uh, had this uh, kind of amazing sort of whirlwind rush of things happening. A journalist calling me wanting to talk about the link between astrology and food. And, and that appeared in a mainstream newspaper in the UK. Um, and then two days later, I get a contact from ITVs this morning. Hello, we love the article. Would you come on and talk about this? <laughs> Can you do it tomorrow almost? Because it's always last minute with the media. So yeah, I went on TV. Um, it's, you know, ITVs this morning, for those of you who aren't in the UK, is a really popular breakfast television program with Philip Schofield and Holly Willoughby, who were delightful, actually. I, I have to say, they couldn't have been nicer. Um, and it was great. I loved it. It was cut short a bit. But I still managed to get some, you know, some serious things in there. So it's this really hard balance with media, trying to be fun and light, but at the same time, put across some serious things about astrology. So, so I think it went well and I had really good feedback and it was fantastic. And I want to do more now, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought you were brilliant, Sally. I really thought you were great and you managed to be smart in a context where it could have been really trivial mm, thank you but you and you looked good oh my god i mean you're a beautiful woman of course <laughs> but that makeup well, wow i know hair and makeup in there for half an hour <laughs> but yeah i thought god if you have this done every morning wow you must just sort of walk around feeling amazing it was yeah they were they were incredible so and i got sort of drivers to the studios from the station and that was all lovely so it was very glitzy um you know and i loved the media world so so gemini i mean gemini is the media star sign really it was classic absolutely classic yeah yeah what was your what was happening in your chart do you know did you well check? yeah it's my jupiter return year i've got jupiter back and forth over my ascendant so you know jupiter's opportunity it's expansion it's growth and on the actual day that i was in um the tv studios Jupiter was making a lovely aspect to Saturn, my career planet. Hmm. So, you know, looking at that, it's kind of like, shall I do this? It's an absolute yes. You know, it's a, a good thing to be doing. So, so yeah, it was classic astrology. Good old Jupiter. <laughs> yeah, Jupiter bringing the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jupiter these days in the astrology world, is people are getting, gets a bit of a bum rap sometimes. It's like too much, well, but sometimes it's just opportunity. Yeah. You know, straightforward opportunity. Really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was fantastic. Um, and what about your month? I mean, how what was have I done? Season? Uh, well, like I say, I, I always love this time of year. My month has been, I would say, one of the little tiny themes of the past month has been doing a lot of reading. I've been reading some new ast astrology books, mm. which I haven't read before. Um, which I've really enjoyed. I uh, had Victor Oliver come on my q a mm. talk about draconic astrology which was really interesting i 
another astrologer called Alex Trenoweth turned up on my front doorstep and came and had coffee. That was interesting. So I've been kind of networking, I guess, in the astrology world, mm. plus catching up on some new ideas, some re- reading. And, uh, you know, I suppose that's Gemini. Yes. Um, and yes. It, it kind of feeds into my own moon, Jupiter and Gemini, which are the teacher learner. Yeah. Uh, planets up in the 10th house so mm. yeah networking and mm. um learning new stuff mm. um still not quite sure that i understand draconic astrology or the purpose of it um yeah. i understand how to get a draconic chart but right. i'm i'm now really thinking about what it means in practice yeah and that's the thing with astrology isn't it with these new techniques it's all very well learning them but you've got to see how they work in real life and that, yeah. that always takes time and experience, actually, to. Um, yeah, you have to. There's yeah. no it's applied astrology, isn't it? That's what we That's try true. and do mm-hmm. is yeah. apply it rather than just theorize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's like the difference between doing an art history course and doing an, you know, or yes, yeah, the difference between art history and art. Mm. And you can learn all the theory you like. But, uh, you know, you have to figure out how to apply it and, what, and then decide if it actually works mm. in any useful way. Mm. And I, it's often, you know, I find, I don't know if you find this, Sally, but I find that as a, it, you know, I need to do it myself. Yeah. You know, I can't just take it as a, as a, a received idea, mm. you know, any of this astrology. Mm. Um, and that's probably why I spent such a long time, you know, working on astrology before going professional, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Well, same actually. But I think that's kind of, I mean, astrology just, you know, it's so complex, isn't it? Mm. You know, it is, it's not, um, you can learn the basics quite quickly, but then to learn the sort of synthesis and interpretation of the astrology chart um, I mean, that really takes time and experience. I mean, I was the same. I did a lot of, and I love the learning around astrology, you know, because it takes you into history, mythology, psychology, spirituality. I mean, just, you know, this vast world of learning. It was fantastic. But the same, I mean, really immersed myself in the learning of it before um, before starting work as an astrologer. And then that's when the learning really starts, actually. Of course, because it's your, your clients teach you, don't they? Yeah, they do. I love it. Still love it. Still learn. Yeah. <laughs> Still learn. I, you know, and it's so interesting when you have clients in the, like the other day, um, I, you know, I, I saw two clients in a day um, and they both had a moon Pluto opposition, mm. uh, which was really interesting across Aries Libra. And it's so interesting when you get these little clusters. I mean, I often find it that you get these clusters of aspects, of people coming to see you with a certain aspects in common. Yeah. And you think, okay, I'm supposed to be learning about this, this moon Pluto. You know, what does it mean? Because um, I'm used to that moon Pluto conjunction. I see that. I've seen that a lot. Yeah. Um, but the opposition, obviously, is a different kettle of fish. Mm. Mm. Interesting. So, um, cancer season, the sun moves into cancer, it's the solstice, um, you know, the, the longest day in the northern hemisphere, shortest day, um, and an interesting shift, it's a real shift, isn't it, when you get the sun moving into the cardinal signs, it's the start of something, um, and the height of summer, actually, for us. Mm. So, what do we think about the cancer season moving from gemini and air sign into cancer a water sign much more associated really with um home family nesting retreating it's interesting isn't it because it's often when we all go on holiday of course (laughs) you know in fact we are all traveling but i also think that cancer you know the the cancer time is often when you go visit the family yeah. Is there's tribal gatherings and there are literally tribal gatherings in the US. There's the 4th of July in France. There's the 14 juillet, you know, these big nationalist celebrations of your nation yeah. um, are also a July thing. I'm sure there's some other ones that I could think of. Those are the two that spring to mind. So mm-hmm. there is that tribal feeling in July. And also there are all the festivals that people go to, like yeah. 
is is Glastonbury a tribal gathering? I think so. Yeah. Um, uh, and that happens always around this midsummer point. Mm-hmm. Um, and all the, you know, a lot of the other festivals that happen in in Spain in July, you know, that's that's a, just a whole season of festivals, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, and those sort of big gatherings of people to feel together. That's what they're really about, isn't it? It's not mm-hmm. necessarily, I mean, I know a lot of them are about the exchange of ideas and stuff, but they're really about standing in a crowd, listening to music that moves all of you at the same time. And it's interesting, it's interesting that it happens in cancer season across the Northern hemisphere. Mm. Yeah, because I often, you know, I think people, there's a little bit of a misconception about cancer that it's just about your home and family. You know, yeah. you get cancer and are like, well, I'm not close to my you know, family, or I don't, I live on my own. And what's that about then? But it isn't, I mean, that's just one small part of it. It is very much, you know, there's this idea of clan and idea of identity, I think, through um, the star sign cancer as well. Um, and, and that's really powerful and important. Um, who's, who's the classic one I'm thinking of? Oh, Nelson Mandela. Yeah. You know, his love for his country. I mean, that was his, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure you could have said that was his family. So there's often this sense of, you know, it's a bigger sense of family. And often people find that you get cancerians in the, the workplace who love kind of gathering people around them, um, you know, and have a sense of family with the, the people they work with as well. So you can expand it out, definitely. Yeah, it's a, it's a sense, it's a feeling. That's the thing that's different about it. So you're not... Um, and I often I have often seen this in the workplace and you know you see people who own their own businesses there are a lot of you know it's a cancerian thing quite often to own your business the family business or to create a business that feels like family mm-hmm. um, I've had various cancerian bosses yes yeah, so I had one who smoked like a chimney actually cancer um, I think he actually also, anyway, that's another, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll move swiftly away from that. Um, but yes, cancer, uh, mm-hmm. creating tribes and being part of a tribe and that feeling of connection mm-hmm. that is through, it's not through blood though, because you don't have to be related. And that's the thing that people you know, as you say, it's a mistake people make about cancer to think it has to be about the blood family. Mm. It doesn't. Yeah, yeah. It can be the family of friends that you've made or the family that you've made at work or the nation itself. Yeah. And also, I mean, I think with cancer, the other important thing for me is the, is the moon, that the moon rules cancer because that, you know, the moon is quite incredible. Like, I mean, the sun is this constant round ball and here we have the, you know, the cycle of the moon is just so much more interesting, so much more changeable. Um, you know, really fascinating to, to, to watch the moon change in the night sky um, and the fact that it reflects the light of the sun. I mean, if you look at all these, these things, I mean, astrology is a symbolic language. What does that tell you about the star sign cancer? And we have this in, you know, I love cancerans because they're not one dimensional ever, you know, they, they really are changeable and emotional and, you know, and really pulled. They're kind of like, you know, as the moon pulls the tides, they're pulled by other people and what's going on. And there's, you can really sense that kind of strong emotion within them. So I think that's a really other, an important part of cancer for me there. The and, also, and also of this month, you know, this coming month that, you know, this is the, the month of cancer where the moon is so important. Um, yeah, I think they are pulled and they also pull people in. I think they have a lot of in the or cancerians. Yeah. I'm thinking, you know, isn't Angelina Jolie a, a cancer? Um, or does she have cancer rising? She has cancer rising. She has cancer rising. And that's us, yeah. I did a piece somewhere on my website about uh, you know, when you have Venus, she's got Venus in cancer as well. On the ascendant, yeah. On she, the ascendant, and she really has that cancery feel of, of you know being ref, of reflecting. Yeah. Um, but also, I know she only ever wears um, white, black, or beige, or sort of beige, which are very Cancerian colors, you know. So she's like either the dark moon or the full moon. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. She had um, 
she chose to have a double mastectomy actually didn't she as well yeah really interesting which is uh, noon again rules you know it rules the breasts and the stomach so there's that that link to um the cancer side of her um, mm. personality yeah she's an interesting one so what yeah. about the solstice shall i get the chart for the solstice up Let's Let's, because I mean, it's, I it's quite interesting when you're looking at the chart for the solstice or, or the equinox, these four markers throughout the year um, when the sun moves into the cardinal signs, you can look at the chart to give you an idea of, um, you know, what's coming, what's coming in the next three months. I mean, the next marker is when the sun moves into Libra in September. So you have, can you see that, Sally? Can you see that solstice? I can see it, yes. Yeah. So for those of you watching on YouTube, um, the video, you'll be able to see it. But for those of you listening in, we'll kind of just talk about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, what, what do you, I mean, immediately, you know, this it's the sun in Cancer is square to a moon-Jupiter conjunction in mm -hmm. Aries. Um, and that kind of is, is, is like the dominant planetary aspect yeah and the, so the, you know that's going to set tell us something about coming uh you know a few months isn't it uh that looks very emotional to me you know the and so we've got a kind of double moon theme out there already haven't we with the sun with the sun and cancer the moon rule sign and the moon's emotional nature expanded by its connection to to Jupiter, I would say volatility actually with this um, and the beginning of something, you know, these are cardinal signs. Um, it looks like a really busy summer to me. It does. I mean, there's, you know, one, one way I kind of see this, this has been part of the legacy, I think of also Mars in Aries activating that Jupiter in Aries. We're in this new phase with Jupiter now, it moved into Aries mid-May. You know, here in the UK, there's there's big news all the time. It's we're in for a summer of strikes, and I think that's very much linked to. It, it was started really on the Mars Jupiter conjunction in Aries, but it is about strikes are about Aries. There's you know it's this fiery individual action fighting for your rights. So I mean I think that's what it's going to play out actually over the next um, three months. It'd be interesting to see. I mean this is just here in the UK, but will there be strikes, protests around the world? I mean, also fires. This is a classic time, isn't it? For too much heat in... Um, yeah, I mean, I'm quite worried about the fires looking at those charts for this summer mm. um, because there's stuff happening at the end of July as well, which looks very fiery to me. And I think that could just be literal fires, could be war-style fires, um, and, or, the, you know, in, as you say, the fire inside, the fire in the heart. Um, uh, you know, it looks volatile and, um, you know, that's all kind of slightly negative stuff that we're talking about. But I also feel that it's very good for people starting off on an enterprise. Yeah, agreed. Behind. You know, uh, uh, the, the, it's like the opening chapter of some new thing. Like if you were starting a new business or if you were starting a new book or anything that you want to start. I yeah. actually feel there's something about this solstice, which is like, right, yeah, okay, let's go. Yeah. You know, and also the other part of that would be, okay, let's go. I'm giving myself three months to get this first bit done. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Or go off traveling for three months if you're lucky enough. Exactly. Off I go. But um, it, it's got, yes, I mean, I, I would be, because of all this fieriness, I would be, um, I would be, very considering of where I'm choosing to travel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wouldn't just go anywhere. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think there are going to be, I mean, we're moving through this extraordinary time in our world, but it, it does suggest extreme heats as well. Yeah. Uh, this chart. But I do, I do love it for that, you know, um, initiation, taking a leap of faith. I mean, Jupiter can teach us so much. It's the planet always associated with luck um but i kind of always you know when i'm talking to clients about jupiter i always say it's not just you know you don't just sit on the sofa and wait for luck to find you i mean jupiter teaches us that you need a big vision you need to be willing to take risks and you need to really have a strong sense of belief in what you're doing and self-belief put those in place 
and luck finds you, you're out there, you know, really seeking the opportunities. So it is about, and it's the planet that's kind of, you know, it's, it's believe, it, there's a belief that things are gonna go well. It's harnessing, I suppose, the Sagittarius link to Jupiter. You know, there's this glass half full that every cloud has a silver lining, things will work out well. And kind of really harnessing that positive side of Jupiter, particularly in Aries. I mean, it's a real trailblazer symbol, Jupiter and Aries. Um, yeah, I, I like it for a travel thing as well. Having said, you have to be choosy about where you travel. Do travel, you know, yeah. go somewhere, get on a plane, go somewhere different, especially like for Leo, you know, um, that it, it you couldn't have a better indication of have a summer where you go on a pilgrimage, you go on a long distance journey, mm. you, do, you know, you step outside your normal, you step outside the box. Yeah. You walk the Camino. Yeah. Maybe. It's going to be hot though. <laughs> right. Yeah. If you do that, please wear a hat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Lots it's, of water. It's, it's, an, it's really exciting. I think for all the fire signs, Aries, Leo, Sagittarius, there's, I mean, it is kind of like, right, let's just get on and live life. Let's do stuff. Um, you know, there's the world is my oyster. Things are opening up. So it is a time to really, you know, meet up with people, have fun, go to a festival. Um, I I think fire signs in particular, it's a time to embrace life. Yeah, I, I would say to Sagittarius, I would say take a risk um, yeah. on something. Doesn't matter what, on love, on, on a horse, on just dropping everything and going. But, you know, feel confident that actually things will, might, might work out, mm. you know? Mm. Um, especially I mean it's interesting that it's we're having this we're still in the pandemic you know there's still COVID is still around there are maybe lockdowns again who knows mm -hmm. but in the midst of this pandemic we have this moment or coming to the end of the pandemic but it's not over yet in lots of places um, so there's that to take into consideration but there is this feeling of something new beginning yeah. And so it's not post pandemic, but it's getting to the end of it. So it's like an overlap, an overlapping moment. Mm. Because the, the, you know, Aquarius, um, Saturn is still in Aquarius, which I think is part of the lockdowns. Yeah. And that Saturn, you know, this um, Saturn's now retrograde and it is going to move back to create that final square. It's not exact, but it will create the square aspect to Saturn Uranus, which was such a big part of 2021. Mm. You know, rules and regulations, the, the freedom, that kind of clash between the two. So that is coming back into aspect towards the end of this year. And yeah. also what's interesting about this chart is that, you know, that we've got the Uranus North Node in Taurus coming closer and closer together and they're meeting on the midheaven. So, you know, and we're in this very unpredictable and erratic time financially as well. Oh, so that's going to continue. And then Mars will meet those two at the end of July. You know, I looked at this with um, Victor on my Q&A, which is actually on YouTube if you want to see it. Um, on, the Q, on the Oxford Astrology Q&A this, this time, we were looking at that because this is an important aspect coming up. But as you say, it's already mm. approaching now. Mm -hmm. from the solstice that we can feel it and you're right i mean it's going to be partly about money although we know that already i mean look what's been happening to the stock markets it's been in and crypto and all of that it's been an incredible plunge um but uranus tells us that you can't predict whether it's going to suddenly flip again you know in a in another direction yeah well, Uranus, it's, it's always with Uranus, isn't it? It's highs and lows. It's like you're riding the roller coaster. You know, there's um, it, things can, you can get rich overnight on Uranus or, you know, you lose everything overnight. I mean, it really is that, that mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not the safe, steady option. And in Taurus, I mean, for Taurians, I actually, I mean, this is a huge period of change for Taurians, isn't it? I mean, this is when, particularly if you've got, you know, there's, um, what birthday would it be? I mean, Uranus is at 17, so it's kind of the 8th of May. Yeah, oh, well, my daughter actually is the 6th of May, right. and she, she's got, her son is at 15, so she's been having this Uranian time. I mean, and it's actually been fantastic for her. Yeah. 
um, you know, she's gone to university and her, she's taking flight. So you've got Uranus plus the nodes in Taurus, so massive changes. So uh, yeah, it is being, you know, Taurus is a sign that doesn't normally like change, but this is a time to say yes, to kind of, you know, change, really change your identity, your attitude, something about yourself. I mean, this is, you know, for Taurus, it is about, um, you know, it's about the personal self as well. So I think it's about liberation for Taurians. Yeah, um, which is really important. I'm thinking actually also about my brother, another Taurus. Um, he is finally, he's a foreign correspondent and he's finally moving countries to somewhere that's actually a lot safer than where he's been. Yeah. Um, and that's incredibly liberating, you know, because when you're in a more volatile country, you're kind of confined, you know, it's more confining. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, it's been a long time for him, obviously, you know, um, that he's been toiling away, but now he's got this liberation, the door is opening. Mm. Mm. So interesting, this solstice chart, isn't it? I wonder whether, I have, should, we, should we move on to the new moon? Because there's some... I, I have one more thing to say about the solstice okay. chart, though, which okay. is important, which is the, uh, there's a Pluto-Venus trine, uh, which I think is very good. Uh, again, that's about money and it's helpful for Capricorns, actually. It's helpful for the earth signs to, you know, there's a kind of a flow that that is, and don't forget that this applies for sort of the following three months when you're looking at this solstice chart. Yeah. Um, so for, you know, for Virgos, there's a flow between it may be your creativity or your children or something like that, mm. yourself, and your ability to, you know, it's a very beautiful, empowered Venus there, because yeah. it's Venus in Taurus with this power coming from Pluto. Yeah. Um, so, and it also it's good for Capricorns because you're getting that Venus uh, flow coming yeah. into coming into Capricorn. And obviously, again, back to the Taurians having an incredible time. Yeah. You know, you may just get a lot of money. If you're a Taurus, you know, or get that contract or something like that. There's just, it feels to me a very lucky omen at the beginning of a season to have that yeah, for certain it, signs. Yeah. And it's so close, isn't it? I mean, really, it is so close when you look at it, the aspect. So to have it on, on the day of the solstice, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I like it also for Scorpio. Yeah. Also, you know, as co ruler of Scorpio. Um, and I mean, it's it's got to be about love. It's got to be about partnerships. It's got to be about relationships. Um, you know, finding the the right person um, to to kind of transform your life actually. So it might be about a love relationship, and we, that Uranus North Node in Taurus as well in Scorpio's love sector. Things could happen quickly. Things could happen really quickly. But yeah, it's about finding the the right person. I think so powerful for Scorpio too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, it's quite sexy, isn't it? Uh, combinations of Pluto and Venus are often quite sexy. If they're in the right part of your chart, clearly. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's soulmate stuff. It's going in deep, isn't it? It's, it's you know, finding that absolute fascination or obsession with someone. I mean, Scorpios can be quite extreme. But yeah, no, it's that absolute, you know, deep attraction uh, when you get Venus and Pluto working together. Yeah, I mean, even for whose who's eighth house would that be in? Is that Sagittarian eighth house? That's, you know, that's nice also for, for that intense um, bonding. Oh, no, it's not for Sagittarian. It's Libra. It's Libra. It's Libra, yeah. So for and Librans, that would be quite an intense, because it's your ruling planet as well, if you're a Libra. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Beautiful aspect to Pluto from your eighth house of site of connection mm. um so yeah you, it's again i see yeah, that one i think is particularly sexy mm. or psychic experiences actually for libra or, also yeah you know, uh, and also making the making the right investments actually for libra you know because yeah it's too. Uh, yeah i would be careful with the money actually wouldn't you because well, pluto can plunge you into debt as well and you've still got Uranus, the Uranus factor. Exactly. House, so I would yeah. be very cautious unless you can, you've got money to burn. Mm -hmm. 
burn being an operative word for the coming season. Yeah, all that fire, fiery energy. I mean, really fiery. Yeah, well, just one more thing vis-a-vis -vis Libra is that not only do you have that Venus in your eighth making a beautiful trine to Pluto, you've got um, Jupiter in your house of relationships. Mm. So again, this season is really, maybe really, really great for relationships, for meeting new people or have, you know, expanding a current relationships. It, it just feels that it's quite em empowered. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it's, yeah. What did you want to do? Did you want to do the new moon next? No, I th do you think so? Um, I mean, looking at what's coming up, that's happening on the 29th. Yeah, I thought it was a really interesting new moon as well, actually. Yeah, and uh, there's, a, there's a mirror of the solstice that I thought was quite fascinating about it. So we've got the new moon chart. I have. I'm just... You know, this, this major aspect on the solstice was the sun in Cancer square to moon Jupiter Aries. And at the new moon, you've got the sun and moon in Cancer, but square to Jupiter and Aries. So it's kind of like the moon is just sort of moving from Jupiter to the sun. And, and this really powerful square aspect stays in place. I mean, just to sort of say about, you know, there's, Jupiter squares can be good. I mean, they're often quite hedonistic or, you know, you can go over the top. There's over enthusiasm there. There's, it's that leaping in. Um, you've got to be a little bit careful of being sometimes with Jupiter aspects of being a bit arrogant or, you know, a bit kind of overconfident. But actually, I, I quite if they're if they're used well, they can be really powerful and they can kind of motor you forward. So for Cancer and Aries in particular, this is really important, I think. Um, and you know, is a new moon in Cancer. This is Cancer season, um, and Jupiter is in Aries in your career and vocation sector, your future path. So actually, this it feels like it's not a time for Cancer to retreat and stay at home. But that Jupiter in Aries is really pulling you out into the world. You know, where are you going? What are you seeing? Where are you exploring in life? Can um, you see I mean, that new moon? I can see there? it now. Yes, thanks. I, I mean, I've got a cancer friend who's off, you know, traveling for the first time in forever <laughs> and is super excited about it, getting back out into the world. So um, really interesting. And they're very, very, the square aspect is really close on this new moon. The sun and moon are at seven, cancer. Jupiter's at seven Aries. So it's again, you know, that, that major planetary aspect taking place on the day. Mm. It's and the same, it's the same aspect, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and the moon has simply moved from Aries to Cancer in that time. Yes. Quite interesting. Yeah. Um, so it's like it's like repeating itself. It's it's emphasizing this this change. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things that the moon is is changeable um i mean i have to comment uh, the other thing that i think is really amazing about this um new moon and i wrote about it in my horoscopes quite a lot for june is this conjunction with lilith with the black moon lilith mm -hmm. which is so close and and lilith has a um you know lilith has a an orb it takes her nine years to go through the zodiac Right. So it's quite a big deal that she's making this conjunction to this new moon. Yeah. I, I had, didn't go back and find out the last time it ever happened, but it's in Cancer. Yeah. Lilith is about, you know, um, childbirth, but also child loss. Um, and the moon is about children. Cancer is the sign of children. Mm. And I'd be interested to see, you know, what's happening in the news around children. There's been quite a lot already to do with you know, abortion, the Roe versus Wade in the States, mm. but also these children in the Ukraine, you know, what's happening to them. Mm. Um, and the fact that we've seen all these images of, of mothers and children has mm. been a bit of a theme this year as Lilith, Lilith has been going through cancer already, but she's now sort of joined actually by mm. the sun and the moon. Mm. Um, so maybe I'm hoping for some reunions perhaps yeah. of these lost children. Yeah um as you know ever optimistic uh but it's really interesting i i i'm and the fact that it makes that square 
to Jupiter in Aries, which is Jupiter in the, you know, one of the war signs. So it's, yeah. this is the sign, you know, we, we were talking about how cancer is associated with nationalism and the nation. Mm. Um, and I'm, again, I'm thinking about Ukraine. I think that's really interesting. Mm. I just have to have an aside because for those of you listening on the podcast, Christina's got this. <laughs> she's got this rather interesting little cursor that is the Earth, is it? Oh yeah, it's the Earth. <laughs> she's oh. Whizzing it around the chart. The okay, you see me kind of... whizzing. I wasn't sure if that should... isn't it sweet. It's very sweet. I can't take my eyes off it. It really rotates from you're here. Circling it around. So yeah, that's I'm I'll getting it around. Like... Where do you want to see Africa? I'm getting mesmerized by this little Earth whizzing, whizzing around the chart. I yeah. mean, I did. I just wanted to. I think what you say is really spot on. Um, you know, from a personal level, these these themes around children. It might be very strong for Pisces, because mm. um, Cancer is uh, Pisces' fifth house. There's also. I mean, the other. I, I actually really like this new moon because um look at venus as well venus is a seven gemini yes, Earth whizzing around um so venus there's a venus jupiter connection also on the day of the um new moon and how lovely is that i mean we've got the two best planets making this wonderful supportive um sextile aspect between gemini venus and gemini and jupiter and aries and I just think that's lovely. That's about kind of, you know, gestures of kindness, generosity, um, complimenting people or, you know, really make the most of this. Um, you know, just I, I kind of on a very sort of almost trivial level, it's kind of a good day to go out and say, oh, your hair looks lovely or oh, I really love you. You know, they just really sort of spread love and kindness. Venus in Gemini, the sign of communication. Um, and very lovely for Gemini to have the love planet there, the, um, the planet that's linked to popularity as well. Um, you know, what's starting in your life that's going to increase your profile in some way or get you seen. Um, it's also peace talks, isn't it? It's peace like, talks, yeah, talks. it is. It's really simple. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously for Gemini, it's, you know, when you have Venus in your sign, it's good for your popularity. And then for the opposite sign for Sagittarians, it's also really good to have, you know, when you have Venus going through your opposite sign, it can mean, you know, you meet very likable people or you've got, you know, lovable people, your love life picks up. And to have that, especially for Sag, you know, making that lovely connection to Jupiter, your ruling planet. Yeah. But, you know, that's a very nice new moon. Mm. So, but I do think it's complex, don't you? Because mm -hmm. there's the square between Jupiter and the new moon, and then there's this lovely sextile. So we've got um, a, quite a tough aspect and then a very uh, smooth aspect. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. But I, I, I kind of, I, it's not the toughest aspect. No. Square Jupiter. I know it is a square is a challenge. Um, it's something to overcome very often, a square aspect. Um, I, I, I kind of I just like it for looping in really maybe this is my Aries ascent yeah. talking yeah well <laughs> yes I think the the other um wasn't that interesting you like it for leaping in um but you have got Aries rising I so. have and Ju Jupiter's on it this year big time so I'm just you know I'm in I'm in leaping in mode I can tell you because um, the other important aspect of this new moon or another one that's interesting things are really aspecting each other let's put it like that but if you look at what Mars is doing, Mars is really powerfully placed in Aries. And I, we should mention this, actually, that, mm -hmm. um, you know, Mars is in its own sign Aries um, and mm -hmm. um, Saturn is in its own sign Aquarius. Neptune is in its own sign Pisces. The moon is in its own sign Cancer at this point. So, you know, there's a lot of strength to this, to these placements. Yeah. And Mercury and Gemini as well. And Mercury is in its own sign, Gemini. So that's, yeah. you know, that's booming yeah. there. It doesn't mean that they're all pulling in the same direction, but yeah. Mars and Saturn are making a very nice sextile again. They're working yeah. together. And yeah. that's, to me, very much about getting stuff done, especially if you happen to be an Aquarian, for example. It's like you can get the people to help you to do stuff or you get the paperwork done. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, because Mars moves mountains, doesn't it? When it can 
actually get behind something. And when it's working with Saturn, that's the sort of work to, you know, Saturn is a workhorse, mm. even if it's retrograde, which it is. So Mars and Saturn pulling together yeah. at this new moon is actually very helpful for, I mean, particularly for Aquarians, for yeah. Aries. Yeah. Um, who else would that be helpful for? Actually, you know, it's also helpful for Taurus, you know, if you're part of a team. You may be working really to well together as a team. Yep. No, it's an it's it's very nice wherever it falls. You know, there's it's it, it is a a sense of being able to get things done actually. Yeah, definitely. And then the other part of that that's interesting, and we we're talking about how on one side we have um, this square between the new moon and Jupiter that's sort of broken up by Venus, very exact. On the other side of the sky, we have a square between Pluto and Mars, which is kind of broken up by Saturn. Yeah. So we've got these two configurations that are not exactly marrying each other, but they're the same kind of configuration, which is the yeah. square alleviated by something in between, interrupted. Yeah. Yeah, but I do want to say that that square between Mars and Pluto is volatile. I mean, it's on the 2nd of yeah. July. Um, and it's, I mean, it's a really interesting square aspect. You know, there's, um, as Mars is getting ready to leave Aries, actually. I mean, it leaves on, I think, the 5th of July. So it's kind of like it's going out with a bang. And Pluto also slowly getting ready to leave Capricorn. I mean, it will leave last, next year. Um, but that is, you know, just be wary of, I mean, it's very volatile, it's angry, it's it's tempers flare on that. So, you know, it's not the day to get involved in road rage or, um, you know, do anything kind of. It does make me think also of the American Pluto return, um, you know, which is ongoing mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, of people taking action into their own hands. Yeah. That Mars in. Aries yeah yeah, um, yeah so make of that what you will but but that is the thing that alleviates it is uh, who we were just talking about it in political terms is rules and the law which is Saturn in Aquarius yeah and playing by the rules that is the thing that will stop that may be able to stop this the Mars from over overacting um, and that is a theme of that first week in July, isn't it? Because those two on this new moon, Mars and Pluto are coming in, coming into the square. Mm. And, yeah. then they, and then they square each other. Mars is pulling away from Saturn. Um, so there's different, you know, as always, there's different things are happening in different parts of the sky and, they re and it reacts differently mm. with your, your chart depending on where these things fall. Mm. I do, I also want to mention, because um, I mean, we've got Neptune turning retrograde as well. At, um, it's on the 28th of June. So it turns, you know, this, and at 25 Pisces. Um, so, and then we'll move back to the degree where the Jupiter-Neptune conjunction was. So this, this, if you've got planets or angles around 23 to 25 Pisces, there's still this sense of, things being a wash or some kind of overwhelm. But what's really been interesting, I think, is the fact that, you know, Saturn turned retrograde earlier um, in June or May, June. Um, so they're remaining in this really close semi-sextile aspect, Saturn and Neptune, they're kind of teaming up and that was May, June and into July as well. And I kind of find this quite interesting. It's like, again, Saturn, you know, that Jupiter-Neptune conjunction was so overwhelming and, and took many people, you know, kind of out, out of real life in a way. And Saturn is such a, a realistic planet. It's kind of, a, I kind of sense that it's coming in to harness those dreams. You know, Saturn's reality, Neptune's fantasy. And they, they are working together at the moment. So it's kind of, there is a chance if you had these big dreams on the Jupiter-Neptune, how can you turn them into reality? Or how can you kind of pull things back down to earth in a way? And it does seem to me like there needs to be this balance between, you know, keeping things real 
and dealing with the facts and dealing with the rules. And then Neptune wants to go off and, you know, and, and dream and, and be alternative and, and, and kind of be quite cosmic. And it's kind of pulling the two together. I mean, does that kind of make sense? I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I yeah. the journey talking about them. Yeah, it does make sense. Um, it's also, I mean, if you note that actually you've got just in this new moon chart, you've got Mars at 25, Neptune at 25, Saturn at 24, and Pluto at 27 yeah. On, yeah. on that right hand, you know, at, looking at this chart on that right hand side of the chart. So this is, um, you've got Pluto, Saturn, and Neptune in these final signs, final signs of the zodiac, right? So there's old stuff, collective stuff going on with those big mm -hmm. outer planets. Mm -hmm. And they're working together. I mean, we all know for a fact that our world is really, really changing and we're going into a new place. Mm -hmm. um, and it's part of this Aquarian energy that started in December, 2020. Yeah. Um, and when Jupiter and Neptune, uh, sorry, Jupiter and Saturn made that conjunction at zero degrees of Aquarius, which is affecting the next 20 years. And we're turning this corner into this new period where we're going to have to, things are changing. We're going to have to change. Mm -hmm. Mars is triggering, doing a bit of a trigger with that um, at this new moon. Yeah. Some, some things are going to come into place and this affects us all. You know, this will affect you personally um, as well. And I do agree about the reality check of Saturn and the big, big, big dreams of Pisces, of Neptune and Pisces. And those may be ideals, you know, how can we create, because we've been, there's been quite a loss of faith in the future, a loss of hope for many people in yeah. the past few years as we see you know climate change taking effect and our leaders doing nothing and the corruption that has arisen or become revealed under pluto and capricorn is just rampant mm -hmm. there's been this loss of faith loss of loss of hope mm -hmm. and actually i think that there is hope for the future and it's partly if we can get that saturn and neptune energy working together mm -hmm. uh, and next year, Saturn will move into Pisces, which is a weird placement for Saturn, but maybe it's a good one because they, so they'll still be kind of working together. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's making those real, um, real castles in the sky, bring them down to earth. Mm. I'm actually thinking of those sort of giant windmills or are these windmills in the sky, you know, which are such a symbol of, um, Saturn and Aquarius, which is the great air sign, the great sign of engineering. Mm -hmm. um, but we've got the technology, we have know-how, we have the incredible internet. Um, it's just a matter of making the, the real sacrifices, which I also think is a Neptune and Pisces thing, yeah. will create a better future for our children. Yeah. And, Gosh, and also that was a bit of a Pulpit. Well, it was, yeah, no, I mean, it's lovely. And I mean, with the Neptune Pisces using the power of the sea as well, you know, it's, it's like it's so interesting kind of diving in on these astrological symbols for guidance and advice. I mean, it, you know, it's quite concrete stuff. It's, um, it's so obvious, isn't it? It's so yeah. obvious. And Uranus and, and Taurus are saying to us, we have the ideas, guys, we have the know how we can do practical change. I mean, this is like, you know, it's, it's bringing fire down from the gods. Really, Uranus does that in Taurus to Earth, which is, it's, this is the double Earth sign. I know, and, and the Earth, you know, it is the Earth. It's like tending, the, the, these outer planets are just revealing so much about the way forward. Yeah. Uh, and I, I love that for, I love that kind of sense of restoring faith. I mean, that's what we need. Saturn yeah. and Aquarius a community sign. You know, we need to, as a world, we need to, we need to be really working towards things and getting practical and getting stuff done. So I think it's very exciting. Yeah. And meanwhile, we have this crazy situation going on with food, but that's a whole another yeah. discussion or bad situation going on with food. Yeah. Um, which yeah. you, know, you can see the Chiron series square there, yeah. uh, which has to be resolved. Yeah. 
you know, how that's, gonna... also that's part of the Uranus Taurus, isn't it? As well, yeah, the absolutely. Uranus, you know, the sign of production, food, what we grow. Anyway, I think we should leap on to the yeah. full moon because we think we should go over an hour, and we don't want to do that. No, um, we want to so, be quick. We're supposed um, to be pithy. That's the whole point of this podcast. Pissy. We're pissy. We're, we're kind of not being that pithy. No, anyway. we're not. We're rambling quite <laughs> today. So we've got, you know, there's, there's, there's some important shifts taking place with the planets. Mars moves into Taurus on the 5th of July. Mercury moves into Cancer on the 5th of July. So we're losing these planets in the sign of rulership. Um, there's a, and there's this different energy coming in. Um, and you can see that um, if, for those of you looking on the video, that the, um, you know, the planets are starting to change and shift as we get to the full moon on July 13th, which falls at 21 Capricorn. So it's the moon in Capricorn, again, not in its sign of rulership. It's interesting, isn't it? The planets are suddenly moving into signs they're not necessarily that happy in. Um, and also in this full moon, we've got the moon in a relatively wide conjunction to Pluto at 27 Capricorn opposite the sun at 21 Cancer, but also Mercury there at 17 Cancer. So suddenly you've got this really quite, it's not just about the sun and the moon, this full moon. We've got these other planets pulled in. Um, and full moons, you know, full moons are often about something coming to completion or culmination. What's coming to an ending? What chapter's closing, I would think is a theme with this because Pluto is the planet of endings. So for Cancer Capricorn, this could be really significant and important with regard to relationships, partnerships in your life might be the time to kind of you know call time on a on a partnership or relationship at this full moon yeah uh you know it's we've had this full moon um this capricorn full moon which happens usually in july or the end of june has been around pluto for the last you know it happens it's been in the same sign as pluto anyway for quite a few years hasn't it so yeah. since 2010 and 2008 um we've had this off and on this this full moon which is sort of a plutonic full moon um and but even though that has been happening regularly we shouldn't forget that if things of pluto come to light at this at this point you know maybe secrets come to light or secrets can be buried perhaps but i think really things the hidden things may come to light um it'd be interesting to look back at july as over the last you know, a few years. I mean, it's a, for Capricorns, this is always an important moment in the year is your own full moon. Yeah. Um, a feeling of, you know, your feelings may be very big. Mm. And um, although Capricorn moon is never the most expressive, even when it's full. Um, no, it's measured, isn't it? There's a measured response to things very often. Yeah. Moon in Capricorn. Um, I think this moon, I actually think this full moon is making some pretty, there's some nice aspects. Mm -hmm. So it is aspecting the nodes, the nodes, the nodes don't aspect it. I mean, you can argue with it. different astrologers will say there's no aspect to the nodes because they're just um, theoretical points. But I think when it's that close, you know, 21 to 20, you know, that's within a few mm. minutes, actually, it's been 40 minutes difference. There's some significance there um and it's a good uh, uh, it's a helpful smooth aspect so it may be that some things come to light that are in a smooth way um it also makes nice aspects to juno i'm noticing um exactly this moon which is the planet of partnership in pisces at the moment mm -hmm. um so you know for pisces this is pretty nice actually mm. um your it may be that uh that you're having a lot of fun with another person or another person is finding you very fun mm. yeah and it's a supportive uh, jupiter uh, juno is quite a supportive influence isn't it having someone who's kind of mm. got your back exactly um, uh, yeah i i mean i, I mean and for me the nodes I, I suppose i'm because yeah i'm one of those it's a bit imaginary point so i only really mm -hmm. consider the nodes more in conjunctions and square aspects as well on the bendings but um yeah i imagine if you've got planet's angles at 20 scorpio taurus 
this is going to be a significant full moon moment. And I mean, that's, you know, for both those star signs, it's about children, lovers, friends. It's those kind of areas. It feels to me kind of definitive time for um, all sorts of relationships. There's people, family, you know, but it, it feels like just something coming to light. During the full moon, there is often this, you get a sense of clarity or you, you trust your instincts and you see things for what they really are. Um, so it could be a really definitive time for, for relationships for kind of quite a few of the star signs, I think this. Um, maybe something coming to light that's been hidden as well that, that helps you see things more clearly. I think it's quite a good party one, full moon, yeah. actually. Uh, you know, there's a really pretty nice gathering in Cancer there. I mean, there's also the bad fairy at the feast, Lilith. But, you know, there's Mercury and the Sun and Ceres all kind of gathered there. There's Venus is in Gemini, which is really nice and sociable. Um, mm. Mars is in Taurus. But, you know, Mars has to be somewhere. Yeah, let's uh, maybe there'll be a lot of, there's a lot of cooking going on in the kitchen. Yeah. So, but, so I'm saying this is quite a kind of social sort of full, full Moon. And full moons are uh, a time know. of celebration. You know, the the light yeah. of the moon that it's brightest. It's a it's a wonderful time of celebration as well. Um, and I'm relieved that it's not squaring the nodes anymore. That we're moving into a more uh, an easier connection in the mm. sky. Mm. Um, it, yeah, it does feel it's interesting. This you know, having looked at these charts, there is a sense of help or alliances this this isn't it doesn't feel like um you know, a month really to be going it alone actually it's it's about finding you know finding your tribe and and creating these helpful alliances which is a bit of a theme of this you know cancer season moving forwards getting the right people on your side so sal aside from these the the new moon the full moon the solstice there aren't sort of massive things happening this month are there I think no there's not actually more. which is quite nice for a change <laughs> it's quite relaxing isn't it i mean that mm. you know we can just feel kind of that fiery energy of jupiter and mars and um in aries and then it transfers when does mars go into taurus what date is that do you have that it's of july yeah. It's of July. I mean, I think that's going to feel like a big switch for a lot of people mm. um, and kind of a relief as well. So it's great to have Mars and, Tor Mars and Aries for a while, but enough is enough already. Yeah, um, it, it's much steadier, isn't it? It's steadier and it's more plodding. It's more, you know, it's a bit reined in, <laughs> but yeah. possibly in a good way. Well, they're not for Taurus, of course, who will no, be absolutely no. long ago for the whole time. Yeah. And not, probably not for Scorpio as well, who will be well. having steamy <laughs> affairs. And that, yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously. Mm. Um, um, and also, you know, not, you know, with, with um, you know, Mars and Taurus for Sagittarians, for instance, that you may find that you have a lot of work. So wherever yeah. Mars falls in your chart and that, that move on the 5th of July, you suddenly will get kind of some energy going in that spot spot in your life. Mm. Yeah, and I kind of th I think for Aquarius, this this full moon's an important full moon for work as well, because um, it's lighting up work and health sector. So some key decisions for Aquarius as well. So should we wrap up there? Because I think we've talked for an hour, which is okay. Let's stop. Time to say goodbye. Hopefully it's been helpful yeah. for everyone. Um, and, you, you know, let's enjoy this month coming up as much as we can um, and come together. Yes. Come together. Tribal gatherings. <laughs> Tribal gatherings to worship the moon. Yeah, that's nice. Full moon swims. Excellent. Enjoying those. All right. Take care. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.